want to talk about today is um, how to leverage our Latino traits. And do you call Latinos Latinos or Hispanics here? What do you call Hispanics. them? Hispanics. Hispanics. So adapt my language, and we're going to call them Hispanics. So um, actually, I was Argentinian until I came to this country and I became a Latina, Hispanic, whatever. Uh, I have never been anything but Argentinian. So, um, so you know, we kind of change where, where are the kind of the, the label people use to name us depending on where we are and what time in the history of this country too. So the reason I want to bring up this topic to you today is because many times, or I would say most of the time. We have some inherited characteristics that come with our culture and where we grew up and the families we grew up in and so forth that become so transparent to us that we don't realize that it's only us who have those traits, not everybody. You just think that everybody is like this and you don't realize, no, 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 no. This is part of what our culture has instilled in us. And so only by knowing it and becoming extremely aware of it, then you can leverage it and use it to your advantage, where, whether you're studying or whether you are in a job, okay? So I'm going to review some of those with you, and I'm going to review some of the um, cultural things that might contribute to some negative messages that you might be sending out without knowing it, and that become obstacles in your ability to grow, so that you can turn them around and use them again to your advantage. So everything is about using everything we've got, not just our culture, but our personalities too, uh, to our advantage. Are you, do you agree? Do you like to do that? Mm -hmm. See, okay. So <clears throat> let's share, tell me, what are some of the positive traits you think Latinos have in common? I think one of the things in the culture, I really enjoy our culture, So enjoying the culture. Mm -hmm. Okay. What we else? Have really strong uh, family, <clears throat> like loyalty. And family. Loyalty so, and family are very strong uh, pieces of that puzzle, right? What else? We're really friendly. We're really friendly people. Yes, <laughs> simple as that. We're really friendly people. Everybody wants to hang out in the Latino parties mm -hmm. because we throw the best parties and because we welcome everybody, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. What else? We feed them food. We what? We feed them. We feed people food. So anybody who comes we over. We feed people. Yes, we are nurturing. We're nurturing in every way, right? What else? Hardworking. Hardworking. What else? ¿Qué se te ocurre, Gabriela? Well, that's part of the well, also, issue. We're hardworking. Okay, we've already talked about that. Think about something that has become so second nature to you that you don't realize that this is part of you but not part of everybody else so that's what we're going to go through today okay so that the next time somebody asks you you can immediately say oh this is typical of we tend to share and obviously we're going to be generalizing with any of these things we're generalizing i'm sure you know latinos who are not friendly and you know latinos who are not hard working right and obviously we're making generalizations so that we can understand and pick from there what works for us all right, so we pass this sharing. These are some of the Latino traits you mentioned and some of them that I added for you. We're attracted to the American dream. Aren't we all here or your ancestors didn't all they come here for pursuing the American dream? That's a big thing because it comes as part of you being an immigrant, it comes with the uh, territory that you're attracted to this land because you want to fulfill a dream. That gives you a drive that a lot of people don't have. People who take things for granted don't have the drive and the hunger and the ability to get through a lot of stuff that we have because we're, we're really attracted to the American dream. We have an entrepreneurial spirit. How many of your parents have their own businesses? Or your family members have their own businesses, right? Or they become independent professionals or they, they start their own thing or they follow somebody else's thing in the family. So that entrepreneurial spirit works not just to have your own business, but in everything. In today's global economy, you need to have an entrepreneurial spirit as an employee. You need to be your own boss. You need to be the CEO of your own career. You can't expect your boss to be pointing out every step of the way. The more initiative you show, the better you're going to do at work, right? Same in school. 
show initiative to pursue a, per, a particular professor to ask them if you could um, assist with them or they could you could job shadow or if you could help them with a research paper show your initiative show your entrepreneurial spirit because that's something you've got okay value relationships we all mentioned we're very sociable we're very friendly right we're loyal we're very loyal these pieces of the puzzle come because the area of the world where we grew up where our parents or grandparents grew up is an area where a lot of unexpected things happen and so the, the governments don't really work that way and the only way in which you can get things going is by building relationships with people and I'm sure Monica who still lives there you know that you can't even get your passport if you don't know somebody who knows somebody at the passport office right okay so guess what that's a gene you're born with that gives you the ability to establish relationships and you're very loyal to those relationships because you know what happens when you, you're not loyal right so we carry this with us and whether you were born overseas or you're born here these are all traits that get passed down from generation to generation because they're subconscious they get passed in values in behaviors in things that you see that your parents and your grandparents do at home how they're loyal with each other and we're going to see how this can turn can be your best ally and it can also get in the way with, for you the, the loyalty we're self-reliant we rely on ourselves again most likely because that area where we come from if you don't rely on yourself you're gonna be in trouble so you rely on yourself and in the group of people that's surrounding you and that means you become very independent you have the internal resources to resolve problems think out of the box not everybody has this okay so cement in your brain that all of these traits that i'm giving you this is not that everybody has this trait. You guys have these traits. And if you haven't noticed them in yourself, uh, one minute to change the battery. Yes, yes. Um, I want you to cement this idea that these are things you have that not everybody has. So that if you haven't yet discovered them in yourselves, you can go back after this and say, wait, how am I self-reliant? How am I relying on myself and my inner resources? on what I bring to the table to resolve problems and to move forward in my life. We're community oriented, right? Aren't we all trying to help the community and uh, feed the community and do whatever we can and we work as a community very well, very tightly. And we're also very resilient, which means whatever happens, we overcome obstacles and we move on and something else happens and we overcome that and we move on. Again, because the areas where we grew up most of the time were not wealthy areas, had some problems, we have issues in the family, we all overcome the issues together, and then we move on and we tell the stories and we laugh about it, yes? So that makes us very resilient. So keep this in mind all the time. So next time somebody asks you, what, is, so what are some things that Latinos have in common? This pop up because you've actually found them inside you. Not because you learned the list, but because you discovered them, and you discovered a lot more. So for a minute, I want to talk to you about predeterminations. Does anybody have a clue, somebody studying psychology maybe, what predeterminations are? <laughs> not just yet. <laughs> All right. So I'll tell you very quickly. Predeterminations, not in the religious sense, but in the more psychoanalytic sense is a group of experiences, ideas, concepts, basically decisions that are made for you before you're even born. And they're ancestral. Some of them are genetic, some of them are familiar, some of them come from the society. And they have to do with these things that have been decided for you before, like I said, before you were born, before you even speak, before you can make your own decision. And there are decisions that are that come down to you. For example, you're born into a certain religion. You didn't decide it, it just you were born into it. You're born into uh, on um, either side of the tracks, as we would say, right? In whatever socioeconomic level, you were born into it. You're born into a set of values and into a set of expectations that your family has for you. Into a set of expectations that your grandparents had for your parents and they couldn't fulfill them. So what do they tell you? I want you to have all the opportunities I couldn't. I want you to be everything that I couldn't do. That's a predetermination because it's handed over to you and you, without knowing, 
you have that as the background music of your life. And you start making decisions based on things you don't even know that you're making your decisions based on. Okay? So, say, I was born in Argentina from a family of professionals. My father is already third generation of surgeon. My brother was born older than me. What was he going to be? Right, so do you see how predetermined that is? This poor kid who wanted to be a pilot, pilot, forget it, you've got to be a surgeon. So he has the same specialty as my father, they're both hand surgeons, right? So I'm the second one to be born in a very paternalistic, very macho culture, like Argentina, Mexico, right? So what was I going to do? What was expected of me? Yes, I was going to go to college and graduate because my family was a family already of professionals, so that's... It's predetermined that that's going to happen. But what else was my role in that kind of society? What was expected of me? Be a mother and have kids. Yes, marry and have children. That's a predetermination I was born with. So what did I do to try to resolve it? I flew 5,000 miles away to New York. Did I run away from those predeterminations? Was I able to shake them off and make all the decisions in my life separate from those predeterminations? No. No. And I'm constantly battling... With the moment that like a major decision has to be made and there's a man involved that's saying this is how you should do it, not to immediately say he's right, I should do it this way because that guy becomes my father, a father figure in terms of you know the decisions are made by the men and you have to follow whatever they say, right? So what I'm telling you is that these things run as the soundtrack in your mind and you don't know that it's running and many times you make decisions that you think you're, oh, this is me, and this is why I'm doing this, because this is me, and that's not really so. That's who you were born, but now you can make your own decisions. So by, again, being aware that this is playing in the back, you can change the decisions you make. So these are some of the predeterminations that have a negative impact on Latinos in general. Work hard, keep your head down. Remember how you all said one of the typical traits of Latinos is that we work hard? That's phenomenal. But what happens with this predetermination? You've got to be, work hard, keep your head down, and wait until people give you your due or recognize you for what you've done, right? Don't ask for too much. They're going to give it to you. That principle doesn't work here in the States. It just doesn't. You have to work hard, but you also have to learn to speak about what you've accomplished, how have you helped others, what your goals are, where you want to go in life, etc. In a way that doesn't sound like a used car salesman, right? <laughs> well, see, I'm not saying go out there and start saying, I am the best. No, there are ways in which you can learn to talk about yourself. But keeping your head down and wait to be promoted in a job here is not going to work. Keeping your head down and expecting for a professor to notice you or give you the opportunity you're looking for to do research in their lab or to be part of their team, that's not how things work. You need to network. You need to develop. You, you need to use your skills to develop that relationships, and we'll talk about it. And to network, and to be able to speak and say what is it that you want. Be humble. Don't self-promote. Connects with the other. And talking, speaking about the Pope. We come from a very Catholic region with a very big influence of the Catholic Church values, both in South America where you come from and here. So what happens? Isn't humility and humbleness a big value for that church? So I'm not saying you need to drop it, but I'm saying when it comes to work, you're going to have to compromise. You're going to have to find a way in which without showing off, there's a difference there, and being arrogant, you are able to promote what you do. And how do you do it? Well, there's a, there are techniques for everything, and you can learn how to do it. But you have to learn to speak up. And this hits you in two different directions. Because you're Latinos and because you're women. And women have the same predetermination. That we need to keep our head down. We need to not self-promote. We need to wait until we're recognized. Because we have, and I'll talk about this predetermination for women tonight. We have the predetermination that says that women need to be seen and not heard. And you need to be the pretty little girl. And everybody needs to like you. And so we don't self-promote either. Okay, okay, talk about a huge, huge predetermination, right? So think about how that, even though you can laugh about it, how that subconsciously is going to influence, is already influencing everything you do and how you behave and how, how you open up. 
and you say something, you feel a little bit guilty and uncomfortable for saying it. Or when you have a different opinion than others, you keep it to yourself because you're afraid what they're going to say or if you're, they're going to think you're stupid or whatever. The next one, there's something called high power, the, the power index. And there are classifications, cultural classifications that Gerd Hofstede, who's a Dutch uh, investigator, has come up with, and they're really fascinating. And power distance speaks about when you have different strata, social strata, in a society, and the people at the bottom support the people at the top as they, as they having the right to be there and as they being entitled to have what they have and be there. So it's not just that the people at the top want to remain at the top and say, look, I deserve this, I'm entitled to this. But the reason why that difference in, 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 stratus, in social strata remains is because the people at the bottom believe that. So they don't do anything to shake things off. So what does that create for you in terms of relationships and in terms of your jobs is that if you're thinking that the senior people in your office, for example, or at work, or in your lives, are up here and you can't approach them, then you're missing out opportunities because you're feeling, you know, I can't approach them, you know, I, I can't approach Karen because, you know, she manages this whole thing. I'm embarrassed, I can't, I don't know how to talk to her. Then you're going to miss out on opportunity. And guess what? In Latin America and in, South, in, in Central America, the power index is very high. So that difference is very high. Just to give you an idea, it's in the 80s and in a 1 to 100 index. It's close to 80 and 90 in most countries. In this country, the power index is like 40. So look at the difference. That's why Americans speak to anybody. When I say Americans, the Anglo-Americans, right? People who are here, who have been here forever, they just speak to anybody. They, they are on first name basis with everybody. With their boss, their boss's boss, the CEO of the company. They're not afraid of approaching anybody. It has to do with that. Now, granted, the more generations you spend in a country, the more those indexes are going to change internally for you. But I'm, I see every day that even Latinos who grew up here, who are second generation here, that gets passed on by your mom. Your mom keeps on saying things like that. Calladita te ves linda. It's like they keep on saying things like that. And so, and I've experienced it in first, first hand with people who have done this to me. Like, no, I can't introduce you to XYZ. You have to ask, I don't know, the president or whatever who has the relationship. So that takes away from great opportunities. And the other thing is um, avoid risk taking. The other index that I pulled for you today is uh, the uncertainty index. And that's an index that measures the level of comfort people have in a country in predicting the future. So what happens is like we all know you can't know the future. But in countries like Latin America, in, in, in our region, in Latin America, where really there's no predicting anything, you know, you have revolutions, you have high crime, we have uh, money changes, you one year, the, you know, you have the money in the bank, the next year the state takes it over, you have no more savings like what happened in Argentina. Or you have um, a lot of corruption and things like that, where really you cannot control anything that's outside of you, and there's very little ability to plan it to the future. We try to control as much as we can, whatever we can. And so we tend to become risk averse. Why? Because there's so much risk out there, I just, whatever I can control, I want to control it. And so what happens is that we tend not to move. And everybody I've been talking to in this area has been born in this area or 100 miles from this area. And in Latin America, what, for a lot of Latin Americans who move to the United States, even if it's one, two, three generations later, when the job tells them, look, there's an opportunity for you in New York, in, in Boston, in Florida, whatever, it's like, I don't want to move. So they don't want to move because they want to control that, that environment. Many times they don't want to take another job and they stay for too long in their jobs because they can control that little group with whom they work and they've known for too long. So they don't move away from, from a, to a different job either. So they turn down great opportunities. So think about this. Think about the fact that this may not have to do with your personality, but with all of this that has been brought to you before you were even born, how much of that do you want to keep because it's really benefiting you and it aligns well with your goals? And how much of it you can shake off? 
You can decide, you know what, this worked for me until now. And now I have a different goal, I have a different vision, I want to change it and I'll do something else. Questions up to here. Comments, complaints. <laughs> no? Dime. So it might be for several reasons. I think that also in the case of Latinos, um, we have we're at the crossroads of two issues that affect us when we don't want to move and so forth. One is loyalty. We're very loyal to the people we work with. And I heard, like for example, I had a colleague who was an assignment editor at a Spanish newspaper, a major Spanish newspaper in New York. But the, the paper was doing very poorly, and she was making very little money. And so I said to her, look, you need to look for a different job, because in your next job they're going to pay you, starting from the base you're making now. You know, So if you're making $35,000 when you should be making $75,000, the next job is not going to pay you 80, it's going to pay you 40. And so you're behind where you should be getting, and you will never make up in the rest of your career. And, and besides, the, the paper is doing really bad. You know, they're letting people go. So she said, uh, I can't. My boss needs me. My boss needs me. I can't leave. I'm going to stay until the end. Guess what? A couple of months later, she was fired because it was, you know, the, the paper was closing. And by then, every other person who was working at that uh, paper was looking for a job. So her situation got even worse. And also, it's easier to look for a job when you have a job than when you don't have a job. So it is also partly in terms of loyalty. It's not just that you don't want to move, you don't want to, you, you want to control your environment, but it has to do with the fact that we're very loyal. And that's what I was saying before. That's a great trait, and you have to watch that it doesn't go against you. It comes to a point where you're not being disloyal to your boss if you're pursuing your own career, okay? Um, these are some of the tactics that I want to share with you. Use your sociability to network professionally. What I was saying before, the more diverse your network is, the more opportunities you have. So don't stick only with the Ole kids on campus. Try to hang out with people who are from outside your area of comfort. That means you need people who don't look like you, who don't sound like you, who don't have the experiences you have, who don't uh, study the same things you study, right? The more diverse the network, the better because it brings in a lot of different points of view and perspectives. And this is the same thing in life, not just on campus, when you get out of campus. Use your entrepreneurial spirit to take advantage of opportunities, to seek new opportunities and for innovation. You know, you should be the ones always coming up with new ideas, with innovative ideas and pursuing crazy things, anything that comes to mind, because you have that spirit to do it. And those relationships building skills that I mentioned and that we, I think, all agree on, um, use it to create consensus and teams. What does that mean? We are great at creating consensus, having people back us up behind an idea. And when you're in an environment, in a work environment, that's a very important skill because you know how to negotiate. You are the best one to put yourself in the negotiation situations. Because you can put yourself into everybody else's shoes. And that's a, a skill that not everybody has. So building that consensus and getting everybody to come up with a decision, it's a very important skill for you to pursue. Okay? And then take it a step further and become the leader of that team. Don't always be with your head down waiting to be recognized. Become the leader. Take the initiative. Right? And finally, Use your resiliency and self-reliance so that you can overcome anything life's, life puts in, in, in your way. And use your resilience to persevere. Because I think we've experienced this in our own lives, that we've had challenges to overcome, retos, right? Things that happen. And you see it around you, how we all get over it. Somebody gets sick. Uh, somebody gets pregnant and the husband leaves them and we support them. Somebody comes across the board and has no papers and we make sure that that person still can 
move forward. We want to study biology or medicine, and there's nobody in our families, and they think that's not a career for women, and we overcome that. So we're constantly overcoming challenges that are thrown at us. So take advantage to show others how that's done. Because again, a lot of people sink in, in un vaso de agua. You know? Anything happens and they just sink in a glass of water. Because they have not been exposed to that. They get paralyzed by obstacles. We thrive with obstacles. And that's again another magnificent trait for you to bring with you along your life and make sure you know how to speak about it. Because bottom line, everything we've seen is worthless if you don't use it, if you don't know it, if you don't use it, if you don't teach it, and if you don't take it to the next level, leverage to your advantage so that you can seek the best opportunities out there for yourself. So, what are the leadership skills required for the 21st century? Empathy, cultural sensitivity, Diversity mindedness, consensus building, entrepreneurial spirit, a can do attitude, and innovative thinking. So, what is that? <laughs> That's exactly what you've got. So, you are the leaders of this century, and you need to own it. You need to own it, you need to know it, you need to, in, to live it, you need to embody it. You can't let it slide, you can't let people talk you down, you can't take no for answers. You really have to believe that you are the leaders of this century. You already are the leaders. It's not that you will be the leaders, you are the leaders. It takes, it involves a lot of responsibility and I think you guys have what it takes to assume that responsibility and take this country to the next level. What do you think? Yes, I see that you're shaking. So now, <laughs> it's your turn. I'm gonna sit down here and you're gonna ask me questions. Or, throw out your comments and your experiences. I'm listening. What do you think is like the number one boundary that a lot of women face today? I think um, it's a combination of not really knowing what you want, but acting out whatever the generations have told you you need to do, or your parents or grandparents or your society, and not being able to put your step down and say, no, this is what I want. So the first is self-reflection. And the second is to understand how to express what you want and how to go after what you want instead of waiting for that to come to you. And, um, and there's another obstacle, and we'll talk about that in terms of females tonight. But there's another obstacle, which is, I call it the checklist syndrome. And it has to do with, say I am um, general manager of a big company, and I come to a meeting and I say, we have an opportunity to open one of our stores in, um, Paris, and we need a manager there to manage 100 employees, and I need to know who wants to volunteer to go open that store. So we have a group of women and men in the room. The women are going, I only speak high school French. I'm not really that great at French, and I'm currently only managing 97 employees. You know, I, I never manage 100, and um, you know, I'm not sure my, my um, my passport is up to date or I'll have to go redo it. Well, she's going through the checklist. The guys in the audience already are packed and, and, and already arriving at the Gaulle Airport in Paris. Because, and he doesn't speak French, he only managed 20 people, and he went and got his first passport for the first time, in the time where the woman is checking the list twice, right? Why is that? Why do we need to always have every single thing that's required? It has to do with this, again, another predetermination that we need to be perfect little girls. And so we're always in the pursuit of perfection and that gets us stuck. You're never getting anywhere because you're letting all of the opportunities pass you by. So I'm not saying there's not an obstacle in the organizations where we work, where there are a lot 
where it is a lot more difficult for women to climb. I'm not saying that that doesn't exist. It does, and it's real. But what can we do about it to at least get a little bit ahead despite that? Well, these are one of those things. To know what you want, know how to express it, and forget the freaking checklist. Just take a risk. Take a risk. And that has to do also for us, for Latinas, with this issue of having to try to control the environment. You can't. You, you have to, when you're 50% ready, you've got to take it. Whatever it is, if you're 50% ready, take it. Learn whatever you need to learn to fill in the gaps from your mentors, from your network, from the books, from YouTube, I don't care. Fill in your, your, your gaps, your knowledge gaps, but take it, take the risk. That's a great expression. That's a great thing to, to actually learn. Are you waiting at me? No. Ah, uh, that's a great mo like, motto to have. I do think um, there are a lot of external boundaries. But the problem, or challenges, the problem is that if we keep on just thinking that they're all only external, then it's easy to give up and not do anything to try to overcome them. So in regards to the external boundaries, or uh, not boundaries, but challenges, you need to become an advocate. And, and that's a different role that you can have. And that's why I created the Red Shoe Movement, which is women supporting women for career success. Because when I wrote my book, Find Your Inner Red Shoe, that came out first in Spanish, um, I decided, you know what, I've been for 20 years fighting an intractable problem that has to do with Latino students not graduating college in, in big enough numbers. And whatever we did, it was only 12% of graduation rate. And I'm like, okay, I don't want to jump into another topic, which is women, and have to deal with another intractable problem for the next five decades. So I decided I want a simple idea, something that could help us move the needle in female representation at the top faster. And so I came up with this campaign, Red Shoe Tuesday. So every Tuesday, women go with red shoes to work, men go with red ties, so we can keep up this conversation about what can women do to continue to grow, and what can organizations do to start changing culture so that it's easier for, not easier because they're giving you a pass, but it's more even, the play field is even, so that we can really grow in an organization. And so by doing this every week all over the world and so forth, I'm hoping we can move that needle faster. So you can become an advocate, you can become a, uh, a senator, a congresswoman to move that. In the science community, like when you're trying to publish a paper and if it's just a woman's name, they don't take it seriously. So you have to at least have a male author for them to consider you for that publication. And like, like it kind of surprised me because like I know that like that there are still problems like with women being on top, but I didn't realize how it was still like a big factor. How me. horrible is that? Mm -hmm. So what are your thoughts? What are you thinking on doing to get over that? Mm -hmm. I um, it's a concern that you have to have a male published with you to be taken seriously. Mm -hmm. So do you, are you going to do you plan on doing anything to try to put bring that to light to change that? I, I wouldn't know how to approach that. Um, well, I think that now that you're bringing it up, it should stay in your mind so that talk to people, ask female professors. Is there anything we can do to change this? How can we do it? Start bringing that topic to the press, to the media. The women is a topic that's in the media now all the time. So this is your time to bring anything that has to do with disparity and, to the, and discrimination, basically, to the media. And get, let them do our uh, research of how many papers have been published in the last 10 years that had men names, how many have been submitted that have not been published because there were women's names. Because obviously, the easy answer is, Oh, men, sub men publish more and women don't publish. And that's not the truth. The truth is, men's papers get picked up more for publication than women's papers. So go a step further and find out how many are submitted and how many are published.
and then find out, okay, if you're a female researcher, are you not submitting your paper because you already know that it's not gonna get published? That's another problem that you need to face. So there is a lot of stuff you can do with your own, within your own space, within your own community, and you should. Come on. I think it all comes to the determination, you said. Mm -hmm. It's like, whenever I was in my high school, I, I had a lot of leadership roles, and there was this guy who told me that, uh, if you keep doing that, you're never going to get a boyfriend, because we don't like girls to be leaders. And I'm like, well, I don't care, I'm going to be, I'm going to uh, still do what I'm doing. And, like, a lot of people like, agreed with him that girls shouldn't be leaders. So I think If this is in Mexico? No, in here. here? In, in, in Kingsville, Texas. So I think that even though we're in this century, the society still is not, has, doesn't picture a woman as a leader. Mm -hmm. And that's a big problem. Mm -hmm. So it is your role to try to help change that. Because it is all over the world. There are some areas that are worse than others, but it's all over the world. And you live in a very conservative part of the country. So obviously there is an issue with women being leaders. And it's gonna depend on you and what your goals are and what your internal motivations are to change things or to, to go with the flow because that's what you've been taught at home and that's what you feel comfortable with and you don't feel that you can break away from that. I want you to know that you have an option to break away from that and that it's not, it's not it is your right. So it's not that you need to continue with a style or with something that's not working for you anymore, okay? You need to use your intuition, everything you've got, because we we only talked about some of the traits that Latinos have. We obviously didn't cover all of them, and you also have a lot of other traits that come from other things, from your upbringing, from your culture, your own individual family's culture, from the fact that you're a woman, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, from the area of the country you live in, etc. So use your woman intuition and your ability to. Um, to have a low confrontational communication style to communicate these things. So instead of facing, you know, hitting head to head with people who are never going to change their minds, use your consensus building skills to show them why is it better for all of society if women get to a position where they can share equally the power, right? And, um, and I think that that's gonna give you a lot of satisfaction. The best way to sell anything that you got to sell, whether it's you want to be a doctor, you want to be a scientist, you want to publish, you want to be a leader, is to show the other side how they would benefit from it. Just like we buy anything we buy. They're showing us how you're going to benefit. Oh, buy this car because you're going to look sexy, you're going to look powerful. I mean, they're selling it to me, right? This is the same thing. Whatever I want, I need to go in and sell them. And the best way to sell to men is to present numbers. And there are a lot of research, check Catalyst. If you haven't yet, have you guys heard of Catalyst? Okay, so Catalyst, I'm gonna use my board. Okay, so hold on, that's my information so you can connect with me. And I'm going to write uh, this website so you can become very acquainted with it. Catalyst. And I think it's dot, I wanna say it's dot org. But if not, it's helpful. So Catalyst is one of the big, most important research uh, organizations in terms of gender issues. And so they come up with the most amazing research because they work with corporations, right? So all of the research that says that the more women in corporate boards, the more women in executive positions in an organization, the better the sales in that organization the better the return on investment, the better the return on their equity. So by having these documents and these numbers on the tip of your hands, you can better sell whatever it is that you're selling. You know, for example, talking about Frozen, but that was the first woman director for business, Disney, and you saw how successful that was. So, Say that again, who? An example, like for Frozen, the movie, the director yes. was a woman, and you saw how successful that was for the first time. Right. Right, and so again, do you have any of you watched uh, The Good Wife? Do you know that show? Do you know Juliana Margulies? Okay, well, that's a very, very popular show, probably for people who are older than you. 
<laughs> but um, it's a very, very popular show. And what, and you know, this episode uh, TV, episodes TV, has different directors. It's not that the whole series is directed by the same director. So one day I'm watching it and I see the name of the director as Rosemary Rodriguez. And I'm like, oh my God, it's a woman director, which is very unusual. And she sounds Latina. So I Google her and I find out that she's married to a Latino and she's not Latina. But nevertheless, I interview her. We do an interview for the Retro Movements website. She's adorable. And she's not only adorable, she's somebody who's very open to tell you how things really are in Hollywood. And her story is really interesting because she's an adopted child. And when she was in her 20s, she became a heroin addict. And she, she was horrendous. Her family kicked her out. Her friends kicked her out because she would steal from them. And she was living as a homeless in New York, eating from the garbage, sleeping in shelters. I mean, really messed up. So she moved to Florida to clean herself up. And after she's in Florida for a few months, this guy, she's, um, wait, wait, she's a waitress. And this guy comes into her restaurant and uh, becomes this Mr. Rodriguez. And, and they fall in love and he brings her back to New York and they marry and she's cleaned up and she starts doing, she had studied film. She starts doing a documentary on her life, which is heartbreaking, and goes to Sundance. And there she hooks up with, and wins in Sundance, and she hooks up with a director who has a special grant for women and minority who are going into direction, TV and directing. And so she tells me, up to this date, when she has directed some of the most popular shows on TV, when she's interviewed by a director, they said to her, they said to her Rosemary, what do you want to direct? What show do you want to direct? And she'll say, I don't know, um, White Collar, whatever, another show. And the answer would be, oh, I already got my, my, my quota higher for that. No, you need to pick another one. So do you know what that means? That they already got some minority working on that show at the director level, so they don't need to have a woman to fill in that quota. So it's not that now she gets her pick because she's a very well-known, great director. She's still being treated as a token. Like, oh, we need to fill this quota, let's put a woman here. We need a Latino for that, let's put it. So it happens across the board. And by being outspoken and sharing this, and we put it on the website, on the, on the article, and by speaking at professional organizations and so forth, you continue to get this out there. And you're going to have to do the same thing. Come on. I know it's horrifying, but that's the world we live in. And you're going to make it better. I'm assuming. Preguntas, comentarios, dudas. Um, I know that I wrote a book uh, for a report that I had to do that I had to do And it was called Nice Girls Serving for the Common Office. Mm -hmm. And it was one of the best books that I've ever read. Mm -hmm. And I have notes about every single mistake. Like, there's 133. <laughs> and, um, I think one of the most important things that I read was that, that we have, um, we all have emotional intelligence and emotional IQ, um, but women test four out of five times better in, than four of the measures. Um, I don't remember that. I don't think it was. It was like empathy and motivation because the same on motivation with men. Um, but like the point is that we are a lot more nurturing and nicer, which can also be a downfall as well. But it's the same with like networking. People want to do more business with people that they like, even if um, what we're offering is a higher cost and less quality. But because they like us and they trust us, they rather do business with people that they trust and like and people that do not want to buy guys and fall under when it comes to business and networking. Well, um, I think, and, and that's a great book, and it should be required reading for everybody. Um, I think it's very important to use this trait that we have, that we're very sociable and we, we know how to be liked because we've trained for that our entire lives, right? And you can't lose that. So this is not about either or. I'm not saying you should become BITCHs, you know? I'm not saying that. 
you shouldn't become witches. What you should do is you should learn how to use your niceness and your ability to make to put yourself into other people's shoes and your empathy to get what you want that's also going to be beneficial for everybody else and also learn how to be more um, harder when it needs to be when you need to be harder like when people don't need to like you all the time they need to respect you and so learning to be respected vis-a-vis all the time wanting to be liked is a huge learning that we all need to do. And I'm sure that the you know our my, our faculty who's here agrees that this is a lifelong learning. This doesn't come natural to a lot of us to to be hard and to to be able to say no when you need to say no and not feel guilty about it, and to be able to express what what you want and what you don't want and not just go with it because somebody else thinks that you should go with it. So I think. Being nice is to our advantage if you know how to use it well. Because the truth is, and I don't know what your political inclination is, I, don't, I cannot care less. What I'm going to say, it's a statement that has to do with this particular person. Hillary Clinton, it's, I think most people think she's very qualified to be a president. But there's a, nice a nicety thing that she's missing, right? There's this softness, somehow, nobody can put the finger on it, there's some of that that she's missing. So somehow she may have gone all the way to being too tough and lost in the process some of that charisma and that co consensus building and nicety that most women have. Because she probably was trained in this old school of the only way to get as high as you want to get is you need to be very masculine and be very strong-headed and be very... And so she lost some of it in the, in the translation. Mm -hmm. Another thing that my, we were talking about that my communication professor mentioned, like earlier when she was first lady, she had like higher voice, and now that she's going to the presidential election, she has a lower voice because they look at that as authority. Correct, because the lower tone conveys authority, authority. And that's fine, and those are some adjustments you can make. But what I want you to keep in mind, for all of you who are, are leaders, is... You don't need to imitate anybody else's style to be a leader. And that's what the Red Shoe Movement is about, is find your power with femininity. Don't feel you have to become masculine in order to get to wherever you're going. You can keep your femininity. You need to add different elements that are going to help you network well and move up in, the, in a world of men still, right? Because talking about the networking, men network differently than women. But that doesn't mean that they get less than women. Most of the time, because they're networking with other men, they get much farther than a lot of us do. So learn how to network with the men using what you've got without having to change who you are. So I see some of you are leaving for class. Sorry. Thank you so much for, no, thank you for hanging out with us. Who didn't get a charm? Okay, so I think I'm happy because we're not that many.